This is one of my favorite spots in Gloucester County, Red Bank Battlefield. It's a great place for a long walk by the Delaware River. You know, you have a picnic, do a little bird watching, catch up on your history. It's an unexpected little treasure where you can relax amid peace and quiet. Ah. Well, usually it's quiet. So quiet you never know that the Battle of Red Bank, which was once the home of Fort Mercer, played a significant role during the Revolutionary War. Uh, yeah, it seems as if history is right here, and that these soldiers are trying to tell us something. Fire low, men! They have a broad belt just above their hips! Aim at that! Wow, he sounds like he means business! Thank you. In fact, they all mean business. The Hessian soldiers are trying to attack the fort, the Continental soldiers who are trying to protect the fort, and the Whitel family, the Quaker farmers whose house is sitting right in the middle of the battle. This battle today, it, it's a reenactment that takes place every October right around the anniversary of the actual battle. And it's pretty crazy out here right now, but not as crazy as it was when the real battle played itself out in 1777. Hold the noise for a sec. So what really happened? Well, for that, walk with me just a little bit. We have to head up the hill and wander over to a place that used to be Fort Mercer, which just happens to be about 630 feet from the front door of the Weidel House. So, yeah, can you imagine having a whole battle taking place in what is essentially your backyard? Oh, boy, here we go again. Okay, so let's set the scene. It's 1777. Very nice. The Colonial Army didn't have a lot of luck defending Philadelphia at Brandywine. Washington took a real beating here, lost about a 1,000 men. At Germantown, he loses another thousand. Well, this was bad enough, but since Philadelphia was the capital of the colonies, having the city fall to British was really, really bad news. The bright spot was that they did win at Saratoga, but overall, the morale of the colonists and the Continental Army was very low. Lower than low. Very low. Matter of fact, I'm lowering my voice just for dramatic effect. Low. Wow, nice. So here were the British merrily romping around Philadelphia. Well, sort of merrily romping. I mean, although they were running things, they were in desperate need of supplies. Food, ammunition, you know, the kind of things an army needs to destroy a nation of upstarts. Well, as it turns out, these supplies were sitting on a few ships, and the only thing that stood between those ships and the city were three American forts on the banks of the Delaware River. Fort Mifflin in Pennsylvania, Fort Billingsport in Paulsboro, and Fort Mercer, which was right here at Red Bank. So close to the Weidel family's farmhouse that you could probably throw a cannonball at it. Okay, now that's not necessary. Now, up until then, the Weidels lived a fairly normal life. Anne and James were farmers who lived on the plantation here at Red Bank. Uh, the name Red Bank has kind of an interesting background. See, the area was originally settled by Swedes. The soil has a reddish color, and so they called it Ruder Odin, which literally translated means red mud. Oh! How do you like my Swedish accent? <laughs> Anyway, Anne and James had seven kids, and fortunately, they were all pretty well off. And they were Quakers, which meant they had a hands-off policy about the war. Quakers believe that there is a little bit of God in everyone, so killing anyone is wrong. But since their farmhouse, which now that I'm looking at is pretty big even by today's standards, was a mere eight miles by boat from downtown Philadelphia, and just a cannonball shot, don't do it, just a cannonball shot from Fort Mercer. They ended up in the middle of the whole mess. Now, Anne and James's children saw what was coming and tried to get their parents out of the line of fire, but, well, they were pretty stubborn. So Anne and James hunkered down and prepared for what was to come. Unfortunately, they didn't really know how bad things were really going to get. You see, during the Battle of Trenton, the Hessian Colonel Carl von Donop was hugely embarrassed when Washington's Continental troops beat the stuffing out of him. I mean, after all, he was a Hessian. He led the world's best army. And to be bested by a bunch of ragtag soldiers? Please, it was humiliating. So, at the Battle of Fort Mercer, he felt like his honor was at stake. And he was out for revenge. In fact, he even said, Is this a fort that will be called Fort Dollop, or I shall have fallen? You like my German accent? <laughs> We're really covering the gamut here today. If only he knew he had a little ESP. On the morning of October 22nd, Von Donop led his 1,200 Natalie-uniformed, well-armed Hessian troops to Fort Mercer to wipe out Colonel Green and his Continental forces. 
They had only 400 soldiers, making them the underdogs in this matchup here. And to make matters worse, just a few yards from here, there were about a dozen British ships floating around the Delaware River, and their trigger fingers were itchy, just waiting to send a few cannonballs up the hill. But surprise, the river here looks calm and peaceful, but the Americans built something called a cheveux de fruit. You like my French accent? <laughs> Which basically means they booby-trapped the river with spikes and poles and logs and all kinds of things that would rip open the holes of the ships. And the Americans had another trick up their tattered sleeves. An informant. It seems that over in Haddonfield there was a young man named Jonas Cattell who happened to overhear some whisperings. Something about the Brits planning an attack on Fort Mercer. So he ran just as fast as his little feet could carry him, uh, about ten miles, and gave the Americans a heads up so they could prepare. You'll hear more about that in another podcast. Let's get back to the Battle of Fort Mercer. To make a kind of long story short, yeah, I know it's too late. Von Donop totally underestimated the Americans. Totally. The British warboat Merlin and the Augusta, a 64-gun man of war that ran aground trying to avoid the Chevaux de Free. And nobody is sure what happened then, whether it was a lucky cannon shot by the Americans, but all of a sudden, vomp! <laughs> And as Jeremiah Greenman, a Continental soldier who was there, wrote in his diary, She was in a blaze and soon blew up with a thundering noise before the enemy could take out all their hands. Oh, nice. The spectacle was magnificent to see at once the river covered in smoke and fire. Meanwhile, back at the fort, the Hessians were crawling all over the place. They hit the north, east, and the south side of the fort, but no matter what they tried, they couldn't make any headway. Outmanned and outarmed, the Americans not only defended the fort, they wasted the Hessian forces. And when they were all done shooting their muskets and firing off their cannon, the Hessians lost about 400 men, and another 200 were wounded. The Americans? Well, they only lost about 14 people and had about 27 wounded. And Van Donop? who declared the fort would be named after him? Well, that was pretty messy. He was shot more than a dozen times. Very nice. And he lingered on for a few days before he finally died. The fort was pretty well shredded, but let's step inside the Weidel house here and see how it survived. Hmm, not bad. Looks like things are pretty much intact here. The floorboards look good. The big open hearth kitchen seems to be in good shape. There isn't much furniture, but that was typical for the times. The soldiers cleaned out the cupboards of food and pretty much took everything else they could carry. Dishes, cloths, blankets. They even rustled some of the cattle. And speaking of Anne, how did she and James survive? Well, after all, the war was literally being fought in their front yard. I mean, can you imagine sitting there in your living room and... Hey! Cannonball comes flying through the walls. Nice sound effects. And all you hear is horrible sounds of people being hurt and dying. Well, with all that, Anne did a remarkable thing. Being a Quaker, she didn't care what uniform her soldier wore. She didn't care whose side they were on. All she cared about was that human beings were being hurt and were dying. So after the battle ended, as soldiers fell, they were brought inside her house, this house, and she nursed their wounds. In the end, the Continental Army won an important battle, not because it captured new territory, not because it turned the tides of war, but because it gave the American soldiers a real shot in the arm, if you'll excuse the pun. Uh, seriously, a win lifted their morale and inspired them to continue their improbable fight for freedom. Today, all the remains of Fort Mercer are the trenches that outline the original walls and the monument to mark its place in history. The Weidel House, on the other hand, still stands. Inside, old spinning wheels, pottery, and really simply and sparse furniture pull you right into the 18th century country lifestyle. Yep, 44 acres of waterfront parkland, a wonderfully authentic 1748 farmhouse, and lots and lots of history that you can see up close and personal. Give yourself a break from the hustle and bustle of the 21st century and enjoy a quiet visit to the 18th century. And bring the kids. Turn them loose on the playground. Have a picnic. Tour the historic Weidel House. And take a look at the place where hundreds of very brave men gave everything they had so that we could have everything we have. It will become one of your favorite places in Gloucester County. You'll see. This project is made possible thanks to a grant from the Garden State Historic Preservation Trust Fund, administered by the New Jersey Historic Trust and the support of the Gloucester County Department of Economic Development and the Gloucester County Board of Chosen Freeholders. Stay tuned for other podcasts that explore South Jersey's historic past. <laughs>